3 of the 30 day challenge here at Vernon Union Church. If you remember two weeks ago, we started with our first theme, which was what? Wow, five purposes community. to the church. Community. First theme is community. Last week, we spoke on the second theme of the 30 day challenge, which was worship. worship. All right. Today, we're going to look at our third challenge which is growing, because life is all about growing. And we've been seeking to become the type of church that's a transformational church that helps people grow in, in such a way so that they can become the very mirror image of their Lord and Savior. That they might be able to become a people that are filled with power, inspiration, and transformation that can touch the world and the community of Vernon with the power of the gospel. And we've done some of these things by looking at some ways that we can purpose our life intentionally. And one of the ways that we can purposefully intention our life is in small group. And I want to share with you a video. Whoops, I may need to actually... Yes, we do. But I need, I jumped the gun on making it large, so give me half a moment. This is the first official Vernon Union Church video. Well, David, thank you for taking a few moments out of your day and giving us some feedback here. Uh, talking about small groups in our 30-day church challenge, we know that biblically Jesus had met with his disciples and, and he had in the disciples uh, small groups and he had them at varying levels. And yet many in our churches today don't understand uh, the necessity of small groups and the value of those small groups. So what I'd like to ask you is, what is it that excites you about small groups here at BUC? Uh, the thing that excites me is that, I mean, Sunday morning is a great venue to, to learn things, okay, and, and to hear you preach. And, but I think uh, with a small group setting, we have more of a tendency to interact with one another, and I get a, a better chance to learn more about my other brothers and sisters in, in church. Um, and also, I think it's a good venue for uh, first beginning to step out in, in some of the history we have. Yeah, it's just a, just a kind of a more comfortable setting and uh, um, a little more chum chum. Sure. So it makes you, David, believe in them enough to come out. You have Katie get on your lap, and you know she's in a developmental age. So about those small groups, what excites you enough about them specifically to come out here at VUC? Well, I, I want to be committed to them, and at the same time, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited by the commitment that other people in the church are showing. That level of commitment shows me that this is something that's going to be ongoing, mm -hmm. and it just, you know, kind of builds on, 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 on each other. And uh, I just I think it's going to be you know just a good building block for other things in the future for this church. If we're going to go places and get, get places, I think that it's going to be in small group settings that we're going to be able to uh, be, begin to interact and, and build them. Amen. So David, if you see we offer another small group after the thirty day challenge, would you be inclined to continue to participate? Oh, I mean, and I've always kind of liked. The small group settings, and uh, you know, for me, I, I think that, that especially with you know, with having little Kaylee, that it, it makes it comfortable. She she can come out with us, and uh, I'm definitely uh, committed to like like you say, doing the ongoing thing. So, give one last question, just as we close our time. And again, I thank you for taking the time to do this. If you were to encourage folks that have not yet participated, what would you say was the reason that they should join us in our next series of small group classes? Well, I don't know why you're not coming out, but can I encourage you that it's a great place to uh, learn more about the Word, but it's also a great place to learn more about me. Not that you may want to do that. To learn more about one another and uh, how to interact with one another. And in that light, we're better able to and, and equipped to handle and to deal with people outside the church walls better. Um, it, it does, you know, it does nothing. Um, it does nothing but but build up the kingdom of God. And I believe that uh, that's what we're doing. That's the business that we're in is to build up the kingdom of God 
and hopefully we're a good witness for Kaylee. And one of these days, she's going to be a member of her own life in a small group center. And maybe even a leader. And maybe even a leader. Even a leader. There we go. Well, there you have it, folks. We hope to see you soon. God bless you, and thanks for watching. Bye-bye. All right, church, does that inspire you at all to get on board with some of this? Are you up for the 30-day challenge and for becoming part of what God wants to do here at BUC? Anybody up for it? Just yes. no? Yes. Yeah. All right, well, then, if you're up for it, why don't we say it together? I'm up for it. So, I'm up, I'm up for it. All right, so let's, let's really kind of press in and hear about our third purpose of the church, which is for spiritual growth. All right, so here's what I want us to understand about the, the church and about our place in it. And small groups are one of the ways that help us to grow spiritually. The first thing that we see in the book of Acts, so flip with me again to Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. We see the very first thing that the, is recorded here in our verses for the 30-day theme is that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The New King James reads it, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. This is one of the important habits that the early church developed in their life to help them grow spiritually. Why would they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching? I mean, after a while, it can get pretty boring listening to the same voice over and over and saying the same thing, can it? Trick yeah. question. You're supposed yeah. to say no to that one. Yeah. yeah. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching because they wanted to grow. You know, like I, I painted that picture with the children. You know, when I was a child, man, I just couldn't wait to pass my older half-brother, who was a runt and a punk in my mind at that stage, and I just wanted to be bigger than him so that I could have something over him. Because he was three years older than I was, and he took advantage of every opportunity to make sure that I understood that. Until I got bigger than he did, and then he didn't have any opportunity to do that. So I couldn't wait for that, and I couldn't wait to get bigger than my mom was my next target. My dad was only about a half inch taller than my mom, but I just couldn't wait to grow. I wanted to grow, because that's part of who we are as, as people. We, we want to grow, and, and the early church wanted to grow spiritually just as the children want to grow in their stature and be better, bigger, stronger. So what I want to ask you to, is today is, does anybody want to be a better Christian? Does anybody want to be a stronger Christian? Are you, are you willing to go after those things by committing, like the early church did, yourself? Devoted doesn't mean, eh, sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. It's not what the word means. It means continuing in. And that's what the early church did, was they continued to set themselves in the environments where they could grow. Now, we know in the natural, right, that automatically, when a child is born, I mean, Maria's already praying for her niece to stop smoking, because that can stop the, the physical health of the child in the womb. So we try to do things to, to, to nurture growth, don't we, in the natural? We try to eat right and have good habits and those types of things. We on occasion we'll even fit in exercise. You know, you've got to do some things that tax you every once in a while. David said, through his own pushing in, you know, he's finding healing by torturing himself. That's what PT does. My wife says that not only does she get paid to play, but pretty much everyone hates her, she said, because she's got just this attitude about, I'm going to cause you pain in order to make you better. That's what PT does. Well, Physically, we know that there are results in that way, but why don't we spiritually ever want to pay the price to be a better Christian, to be a healthier Christian? Why is it that when things get hard, we go, no, I'm not going to do it, just going to avoid that altogether, then I don't need to think about it. You know? And, and that's how many folks who attend church go about their day and go about their life. 
And it's not okay. It's time for us to press in and to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of us. So that's what the 30-day challenge is all about. And, and something in us that wants to grow makes us really kind of come about in such a way that, man, when I was a kid, I was excited about growing. And as a Christian, I became, I can remember the first Bible study I attended, not like Sunday school, but you know, like David was talking about in the video, small group. I can remember the first small group I attended. It was a study in the Methodist Church, and some of you that were around the Methodist Church may, may remember it. It was called the Trinity Bible Study. And it was kind of an introductory Old Testament and New Testament. And it gave you a span of all of the scriptures so you could kind of understand some of the stories but the context in which they were written and things. And I was just a young adult and I was soaking this stuff up, going to these adult Bible studies and was so excited about the things that I was finding in the Word of God, even in an introductory course, that it made me want more. And doesn't that sound like something that that, that we would want to do is to have more of God in our life. That's what spiritual growth is all about. And so we want to become committed to it so that we can experience it. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. 1 John. Go back to the end of the book, turn back a few pages. You'll have 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. Chapter 2, yeah, I did skip you, but it just is a couple pages, you can go right over it. 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. Because in this we have here uh, spiritual insights about how to grow. And, and what I want you to understand about what is happening here is John wrote this not when he was a child or even a young adult. John wrote when he was maybe 60 or 70 years old. And that was fairly old back in these days. So he writes kind of as a grandfather, if you will, to younger people. Okay? He was the patriarch, one of the patriarchs of the church. And he had spent time with Jesus. And he wanted to share some things with those who didn't know so that they could grow up in those things. And this is what he says in these three verses. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked ones. So he can have this patriarchal, grandfatherly figure trying to remind his children and grandchildren. Can any of you identify with that? I, I haven't yet been blessed with grandchildren. I can't wait, but I don't have them yet. But you want to pass on some things. You want to help them grow. I just read as I, as I look at a smiling, nodding face back here. Seven months old? Swim lesson yesterday? Is that right? Nine months, Nine months old. I couldn't remember the age. Nine months old swim lessons. And, and Lori just went to Dave. Did you go to? Yeah? All right. They just went to go see their little grandchild developing. Nine months old, throw them in a the pool, let them go. You know? <laughs> but, but just wanting to be there and encourage and watch and, and see the development. You know, and, and that's what John wants to do to the, to the early church members and, and what I hope to pass on to you in some measure today because John is speaking to spiritual children, spiritual young men, and spiritual fathers. It's right here in the three verses. And he says to the children, those who have received Jesus, your sins are forgiven. And he's just reminding them of that, that their sins are forgiven. Now, church, there are some of us that are older in our years that need to be reminded of the very fact that our sins have been forgiven in Christ. Some of us don't live with that aware knowledge all the time, and so the enemy gets a hold of our life and kind of beats us up over them. And he's talking to the young men, and he's speaking to them. Oops, I forgot to go on here. He's speaking to the spiritual young men, and he's saying that you're strong. He says you're strong for a reason. You're strong because you're regularly in the Word of God and, and you're involved in the things of Christ and in advancing His kingdom. 
and thereby you can overcome the evil one. Church, I don't know about you, but in my own life and for the life of the church, I want people who are overcomers. Overcomers are wonderful people to be around. That no matter what comes their way, they're not going to be beaten down and, and defeated. They're going to be people who are going to believe God and are going to be able to rise up. And, and that place in God comes by faith. And it comes by faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It, it comes just as John said here, when we spend time in the Word of God. And so they're strong because they spent that time. And when we don't spend time in the Word of God, what happens is when life presses in and things get hard, our world gets shaken and we feel defeated and we don't overcome anymore. How many of you here would like to be able to overcome your circumstances? Yeah. Really? Just a couple? Wow. I, I'm just amazed. How many of you would like to overcome your circumstances? You want to be you know, or you want to overcome? You know? I mean, that's, that's what it ought to be. Because too many times what happens is things get hard and we sink. How many of you know that this is pretty much a lousy way to live? I'm still talking to you down here, but it doesn't quite have the same effect. I mean, I can continue this way, church, if you want me to. No, the video's going to look pretty funny, isn't it? <laughs> but that's how the outside world sees us. Did you ever think of that? There's people hidden behind the pulpit because we've sunk. And they don't see the light of Christ in us at all. Did you ever think about that? I want to be able to rise up, church, and I, and I want for you to be able to rise up and not let the circumstances be victorious, but you be an overcomer. Jesus said, take heart, for I have overcome the world. Take heart. Joshua, God said to Joshua, be strong and courageous, Joshua. Be strong and courageous, for I am with you. And Jesus, in departing from this life, said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, but I'll send you another, the counselor, the comforter, and he'll be with you always. <laughs> And then he speaks to the spiritual fathers. And he says to the fathers that, that you have a relationship with the Lord long enough and deep enough to know the character of God, that he who is eternal is from the beginning and is victorious and shall be at the end. And so we want to be those types of people who grow up from children to young men, to spiritual fathers and mothers. We want to be like Paul said. When I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. There's a maturing and a growth that causes us to rise up in the things of God that God wants us to get a hold of. Stop being babes. He says it in other places. He said, though you want to be eating meat, you're still drinking milk. He says, you're not mature, you're immature. You need to grow up. And the Word of God says to us that God has given us everything we need for life and for godliness. Well, if we have everything that, that we need, that means in our young age, we've been given the milk, the pure milk of the Word of God. And in our advancing years, as our bodies are growing and developing, and as in, in the spiritual sense, as our spirits are giving, uh, growing and developing, He's given us the meat of His Word. He feeds us. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Are you eating of the table of the Lord? Are you eating of the Word of God? Are you tasting and seeing that the Lord is good? Because you ought to spend some time in the Word of God so you can know what the promises of God are. How many of you know that no matter what God says, if you don't know it, you can't possess it. And if you can't possess it, you can't enter into it. And if you can't enter into it, you can't experience it. So you're still wandering around going, I wish God would do something. And God said, I've given you all that you need, but you're not doing a thing. It's time for us to develop. It's time for us to grow. It's time for us to mature. It's time for us to enter into the things of God. Listen, as a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa, you can only do so much. But when your children reach the age of accountability, don't they become responsible for themselves? They might break your heart, the things that they do, but you can't do a thing about it. God's telling us, church, grow up. Take responsibility for yourself. Feed yourself on the living Word of God. 
mature in the depths of understanding of who God is. And then, and then, once you've reached some stages, Barbara, come up here for me. I just know Barbara, she's so sweet. Yeah. Then when you've outlived some folks for long enough, <laughs> you become the matriarch, don't you, Barbara? Yeah, you become the matriarch. And because you're the matriarch of the church, people look to you and say, Barbara, how old is the church building? And Barbara knows because she spent some time in these things. You know? No, you weren't dealing with this book. You weren't dealing with this book. That's what I But you know, when you spend some time in the things of God, and you become developed enough in them in yourself that you know these things for yourself. They're not just heading on to a theory. They just become a part of who you are. You know? And so, so how are we developing in our own spiritual life? Are they becoming part of who you are? Or are they just heading on to a theory? You know what they say. But you don't have a depth of, of, of understanding that comes from within yourself because you haven't immersed yourself in it. You know? And so, so when we develop, you know, I want to be able to be, this has always been my image. And I'm not going to grab this is my image. I've always, and I even want to be called grandma. I, I love that name. I don't know why people want fancy other names to you know, make them not sound so old. I want to be grandma. And I've always thought of myself as the guy sitting in the rocking chair with his little lid on, smoking a pipe, passing on truths to my grandchildren. You know, as they sit on the lap. And, and because I want them to know that from the depths of my being, I want to share with them all that I have gleaned. And I'm not perfect, church, and we're not perfect, and that's okay. But we know the one who is, don't we? We know the one who is. And if we know the one who is, it comes because we've spent time with him. We can know a whole lot about it, but you can't pass on. You can't give what you don't know. You hear me on it? You can't give what you don't know. I can't give you any knowledge today about, is it Miriam? Okay. I can't. It's just a product that they're involved in, just because they're here. Everyone knows that I pick on people that I see that I know. But I can't tell you even a thing about it, because I know nothing about it other than it's some cream that's supposed to make you look good. That's about what I know. That's what we're saying. And it's expensive. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying to you is this. I haven't spent enough time in it or around it for myself to know a thing about it, so I can't tell you anything about it. But if I've spent time with it, I can. Lori can. She can tell you something. She spent time. But I can tell you about something. That'll make you look a whole lot more attractive to a sin sick and dying world. I can tell you about the Word of God because I've spent some time in it. And I believe in it. And it's proven itself to be true in my life. And because I know the depths of God's great love for me, I can then share to others who are hurting and broken that God's going to love them too. No matter who they are, no matter where they've been, no matter what they've done, no matter what they walk in now, that's love for them is an unfailing love. And because his love is an unfailing love, I know when things get hard, he hasn't abandoned me. If I honestly look around enough in my own life, it's probably that I've abandoned him. But God's always moving us back to himself. But you have to do it for yourself. Because you can come and, and listen to me every once in a while or whatever floats your boat and, and hope to, to glean some truth up here. But until you own it for yourself and walk in these things, it does you absolutely no good to just have a head knowledge. It's going to become something you own. Because if I never try near it, it's never going to help. If you never try the Word of God, it's never going to help. You've got to do it for yourself. And, and that's what spiritual fathers do, is that they've done it for themselves and they pass on what they learn because life is all about growing and, and spiritual life is all about spiritual growth. And, and, and the minute you stop growing, you're in trouble. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 with me.
Colossians 2, 6 and 7. As you therefore have received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And, and so Paul's writing to the church and Paul is saying, walk in these things. And he, and he says, and all I'm going to do is read the first word of verse 8, beware. Beware. The moment you stop growing, you start dying on the inside, if not on the outside. And here's some warning signs that will tell you if someone is dying on the inside. And spiritually, church is what I want us to, to become aware of for ourselves. The moment we stop learning is the moment we stop dying spiritually. The moment we stop maturing is the moment that we stop dying on the inside. And the moment we stop caring is the moment we stop start dying on the inside. To stop learning, maturing, and caring is a sign of decay. Have you ever met people, even outside of church, who don't learn, who don't mature, and who don't care? You know, I mean, they're tough to be around. And you know, it's no different in the church. When we stop learning, and maturing, and caring, we start to decay. And, and here's what I know about decay. One bad apple. Hey, you can have a whole bushel and put one bad apple in it, and that decay is going to spread. What's that? Yes, yeah, it gets nasty, doesn't it? Tough to be around. Uh, fruit flies, like it. Well, hopefully we're a little bit better than fruit flies, too. That's, the A here is for growth, yeah. not for regression. These people become stunted, and, and, and stuntedness can happen to anyone, but God never intends for that to happen to anyone. So, so here are some warning signs for yourself or for loved ones. When you stop learning, maturing, or caring, you better start taking a look inwardly, because something's going wrong and decay will set in. So that's something about how to prevent decay is by being aware of what it looks like. And life is really all about growing. God wants you to be rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Hey, when you think of the word abounding, do you think of someone who's kind of fallen down and hidden behind the pulpit? What do you think of when you think of the word abounding? I have it. Yeah, man, Tigger on steroids. That's what I think of. Tigger on steroids. Man, just, just grace abounds and, and, and life abounds and love abounds and it just flows out and it becomes just something that's so contagious and so energetic. And I will say this about that. For some people, they don't like that. But they don't like that because in some ways they've never experienced it for themselves. And so they don't know how to receive that. And so they don't know how to enter into that. But God doesn't want us to be a people that are shriveling up and dying. He wants us to be a people who are alive, who are, who are filled with a zeal. Paul says to Timothy, the fan to fan the gift that was within you and the constant admonition of the word to just be able to, to abound and to excel and to thrive. And, and to really grow up in the things of God. Birds grow, bees grow, plants grow, trees grow, viruses grow, germs grow, microbes grow, and fungi grow. Everything that is living is growing. Everything. So my question for you, Christian, is are you growing? Are you growing? Because to not grow is to begin to decay. found an illustration that reminds us that every computer application that you own, PC, Mac, it doesn't matter what it is, it gets updated every few months now, doesn't it? If you have something that's a year old, it's out of date. Because it's not keeping up with the growth of the technology 
and, and the application of that growth that can better situate your PC for the work that you want it to do. And it's rapidly happen, happening. And, and to not keep up with that is to risk falling behind. To risk falling behind. Now, I'm not saying that everyone needs to go out and get the latest technology. I'm not even advocating for that. But just how the development of the stuff is. If anybody here has a computer that's more than two years old, it is so antiquated you can't even believe it. And let me just show you how rapidly this stuff happens in our life, because it's amazing to me, like we were talking about last week. When I was in high school, computer science consisted of a room that was, well, maybe if we split the room in about, I don't know, the elevator, or just kind of look over here. So we had desks and a blackboard and a wall. What do you suppose was on that wall? Nope. I'm not that young, Jim. <laughs> nope. No, the I was computer. on this wall. Yeah, the computer filled the whole wall, floor to ceiling. And you punched in a little card that had dots, you know, zeros and ones. And, and you fed the card into the computer, and you could do mathematical equations, and you could learn some things, and you could spit some stuff out. But man, it took a whole wall to do that stuff. <laughs> and now, on my cell phone, I can do more than I would have dared ask or imagine back in the late 70s, early 80s. Quite an advancement, isn't it? Technology's grown, and while it's grown, it's actually become much more practical and useful, hasn't it? Much more practical and useful. And even those who don't understand everything about it can use it. Church, bear with me on this. As you grow, you become much more useful and practical and even everybody who doesn't understand head knowledge, theology, and all that stuff. You become somebody. Yeah. <coughs> useful for them. They can use your friendly. Use your friendly. They might be able to come to know the love of Jesus just because you've grown so much in it that they can catch it from you. I have an icon on my phone right now. It's, it's shown up in the last few days. I have no idea how to get rid of it, even what it means. I thought I took care of it, it went away, then it came back. And so I flipped down my eye on my phone here, and it says I'm low on space. Well, so I deleted my email accounts. I got rid of all my text messages that were on the phone, and in deleting one of my email accounts on here, it deleted it on the computer. I went, oh, 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 I lost three and a half years of emails that I kept on purpose. They're gone. Cyberspace. So if I don't get back to you, that's really bad. I'm sorry. But that's what happened. But I don't understand everything, but you know what? I can still use the phone, can't I? And somebody else that knows more about it can help me, can't they? Um, are you growing? Yeah, Rob. <laughs> are you growing, church? You know, are you growing? So that others might be able to find in you the picture of Christ that they're meant to find? You need to grow just to keep up. Just to keep up. How many of you know there's an enemy of your soul? Mm -hmm. Yep. I hope so. Yeah. He's after you. And in order to keep up with the one who seeks to deceive you, who seeks to lie to you, who seeks to destroy you, you might want to keep up with the Word of God so you'll know the wiles of the devil and so that you can stand against him. Just to keep up, you need to grow. To go forward, you need to grow, because if you don't go forward and grow, what happens is you become outgrown. You know, I was, and Dave's not here today, Dave came. I was talking to Dave this week, and some of you were here when we were talking about it. The person, persons, the company, whatever that he works for, is dealing in technology, and they're becoming outdated, and they're becoming obsolete, and it's making it very hard for David and others in that company to make a living, because they haven't kept up with the growth. Just keeping up is important for you to be able to grow. And here's a thought for those of you that are older and said, well, I've done all the growing that I can. We should be getting better until the day we die. Mm -hmm. We should be getting better until the day we die. Our bodies are breaking down, but our spirit doesn't need to. Our bodies are breaking down, but our minds can stay sharp as long as we have our health. We can be more in love with Jesus and, and serve Him in different ways than we did even when we were young men, when we were strong, as the Bible says. Because we have gleaned some things from God. 
In Romans 12, 2, we're told a very important thing about, oops, I skipped that one there on there. Romans 12, 2, we look at Romans 12, 1 last week, you may or may not remember that, but that's all right. Romans 12, 2 completes that verse. <coughs> and, and what are we keeping up with? What are we growing in? <coughs> not only do we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, that's worship, that was last week. In Romans 12, 2 it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Are you growing in the things of God so that your mind is being renewed day by day? Because if you're not growing in the things of God, you're, you're being conformed to the pattern of this world. And if you're being conformed to the pattern of this world, you're taking on death. And if you're taking on death, it's really not a great place to be. God wants us to be transformed. I have a video that I want to share with you as a means of making a point about this transformation. Because I think it was stated in a way that's more user-friendly for you all and stated more eloquently than I could ever do it. Ephesians 2.10 says that we're God's workmanship, His masterpiece. I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I don't really see a, a masterpiece, you know? I mean, maybe a Picasso, it's like, <laughs> but I want to be His masterpiece. I want to be everything He created me to be. And so I go to Him in prayer, and I say, Dear Heavenly Father, do whatever it takes to mold me into the image of Your Son. Make me your masterpiece. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi. Whoa. Who are you? I'm oh, God. You said the prayer, so here I am. You're not God. No, I am. You said the prayer, it's how it works. Okay, okay. If you're God, then uh, make it snow in here. You know what? I really don't want to make it snow in here because it'll get kind of yucky. Yeah, you're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. I do. It's a Greek word. No. Okay, okay. Um, if you're God, what does Lamentations 15 9 say? Lamentations is only five chapters. It's a very short book. No. Why was it so short? I was tired of lamenting. No. Okay, okay. okay. If you're God, who's going to win the World Series this year? I run out of playing games. Why are you so much in playing games? You are God. Okay, you're right. Anyway. You answered my question with a question. I did? <sighs> yeah, I did that. Don't I? Yeah, yeah. Step right up. Here we go. Hey, all right. Hey, what are we doing? I'm going to make you my original masterpiece. This is the process. Oh, okay, got it. Wait, wait. What are these about? These are the tools that we use to make you into my original masterpiece. Okay. Hang on. Yeah. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Step right up. Here we go. <laughs> oh, hang on. How do you know what to chisel away and what to leave? I take out everything in your life that doesn't belong there, kind of like dead weight. Ooh, speaking of dead weight, could you chisel right here? <laughs> Shut up, I was in my 20s. I grew around and came back, so I don't even know why you created that, but I can't get rid of it. I mean, I've tried everything. I, I tried running, I tried lifting weights. My wife actually talked me into trying Pilates. That was awkward. But I can't get rid of it. So if you would just chisel around here, and then, you know what, if you chisel a line right here, maybe four, maybe eight lines right here, that would be awesome. You're funny. You may be that way. I also never a lot of us. All I'm saying is, most of my children, when it comes to this process, they just want to talk, but they don't want to do the work. So, do you want to talk or kind of chisel? Talk, chisel? No, 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 no. I choose to chisel. All right. Through my Holy Spirit, I'm going to bring up things in your life that I want you to work on. Like your anger. I created the emotion that you use it in the wrong way. Um, compare yourself to others instead of me. You tell little white lies because you want people please. You're lazy. But you try to fool everybody by looking really, really busy. You have a problem with lust? Time out. <laughs> I don't really have a problem. You don't have a problem with lust. No, I can do it any time I want. And hang on a second. I mean, I, I gotta admit, I, I feel like you've been doing some great work and I'm looking pretty good right now. Alright, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? 
the same day. Okay, then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately you as the people need to see my son. Okay, don't misunderstand me. It's just um, when I look more like Jesus, people get uncomfortable around me. I mean, even my church friends are like, oh, you're holier than that. You know, and I don't want to make those people uncomfortable. So what you're saying is you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. That is not what I said. That's what you meant. Yes, it is. Um, it's hard to talk to you. You know everything that I'm thinking. I'm just saying, you've done some great work. Maybe we take a break, some battles from each other, you know. I'll stay right here, and then, you That's know. just that you never just stay right there. You're either moving toward me or away from me. But never you just stay. What you're doing is called control. Do you want to control things or life? Or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control. No, chisel, chisel. All right. But can we chisel or I want That's called control. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> This right here is a secret sin that you keep running to when you're hurting, angry, lonely, tired, that you think you're fooling everybody, but it's making you a whitewashed tomb. Are you ready for me to chill this out of your life? Yeah. You see, it's a process. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's your whole life. You need to care so deeply about what other people think of you. It's rubbish. It's garbage. The greatest thing you're going to hear is at the end of your life, when you hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant, that's what you keep your eye on. That's the prize. Heaven word. It hurts. Oh, trust me, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. I just, I don't think you understand this pain. Pardon me? You're asking me to sacrifice a lot, God. Don't talk to me about sacrifice. I know all about sacrifice. I sent my son down on the cross for pain, for sin, but I also did it for another reason, to give you freedom. Do you know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results, and there are things that you've been doing for years. These empty wells that don't have anything to offer. You've been going to them, and it's insane. Allow me to chisel them out of your life. I'm allowing you to produce character when you keep focusing so much on your image. Okay, but I was thinking. You're not on my phone. Okay, but if we want another way. Oh, I can't. You can't what? I, I, I can't be good. That's your excuse. That's your excuse is that you can't be good. It's not an excuse. I can't. Oh, my child. In the beginning, I said it was good. I make you good. Be good. Yeah. Do you know both? What? No one is nothing, okay? You wouldn't understand. I, God of all the universe, wouldn't understand something one of my children has to say. Try me. It's just, um, I let you down so many times, God. No, my child. You were never holding me up. I hold you up with my victorious righteous right hand. And every day the way around, in this relationship, I hold you up. Okay. Chisel away. Just, just be prepared for what you're going to find me. Because I know what's inside. Because I can every morning. And I look at him in the mirror. And I hate you what I see. Because deep inside of it, this, this, this little kid who gets up every morning and dresses like an adult. And I go out and I, I, I try to do what I'm supposed to do, but I can't, okay? I can't be who everybody else expects me to be. God, I can't even be who I want to be, but that's who you created me to be. And so inside is this scared, stupid little kid. But you chisel away. You have listened to so many voices for far too long that were not for me. And you have totally bought them with the lie, haven't you? You think you're junk, don't you? When you lay your head down at night after you've done the dance to get the hug, you think you're junk. Listen to me. I don't take time to make junk. How can I show you that my love for you stretches as far as the east to the west? That can I show you that my love for you has no end? I know. Reach in that pocket. What? Reach in that pocket. Why? Are you arguing with me? Reach in that pocket. God. Yes? I just do. 
God, I'll do that right now. You're just saying my name in vain. Come on, it's, it's a name, it's a saying. It's a name above all names. It's more than a saying, it's more than a name. I want to teach you something about my name. Reach in my pocket. Breathe on your breath of God. 